The title of our sermon this morning is Prepared and Empowered to Preach. Prepared and Empowered to Preach. And we are in part two of this little sermon series in John chapter 16 from verses 1 through 15. And as we come to our text again, we began this text last week and took a look at the first few verses here in John chapter 16. But as we come again to this text, John chapter 16, verses 1 through 15, again to remind us of our context, the Lord Jesus Christ is walking toward Gethsemane with his disciples. It's the eve of his crucifixion. The Lord is about to be killed, murdered. He's about to be arrested in the garden, tried, mock trials. He's going to be scourged, and he's going to be hung on the cross and murdered by lawless hands according to the foreordained purpose of God. And he's going to depart by means of the, his cross, depart by means of the crucifixion to the Father and going to depart his disciples. Now, as the Lord departs to the Father, as he leaves his disciples, these men are going to face the undiluted hatred, the undiluted hostility of this world. As we do in the Lord's absence, when we preach the gospel, we face the hatred and hostility of a dark and dying world. First here, in this text from verses 1 to 15, the Lord Jesus Christ wants to warn them of this. He wants to warn them of what's coming. And that warning serves two purposes. First purpose is that it prepares them for the work of the ministry that they've been called to. To be forewarned is to be forearmed, so to speak. He's preparing them for the work that he has called them to. But second purpose that these warnings serve is to build their faith in him. He says, when those things happen to you, remember the words that I spoke to you. In remembering those words, in remembering the Lord's gracious warning of the persecution that's coming, it has the effect of building their faith and trust in him. Now, secondly, in this text, he wants to reassure them. First, he wants to warn them. Secondly, he wants to reassure them. And he's going to reassure them with the promised coming of the Holy Spirit. First, the Holy Spirit's work in the world. And we'll see that today as we work through this text. And secondly, the Holy Spirit's work in the church. And we'll see that next week as we conclude John chapter 16, verses 1 through 15. The Lord's warnings here, these warnings show gracious care and concern. He loves them right? He loves them. Having loved his own who are in the world, he loves them all the way to the end, and he warns them here out of loving concern. It's a part of his, his loving kindness toward them to warn them of what's coming. He loves them. His parting instruction here, these last words before he departs from them, show his gracious care and his concern for them. His parting instruction demonstrates that love. Now, several times, beginning in John chapter 15, now as we go into John chapter 16, several times he warns them of the world's hatred. He warns them of the persecution that's coming, the persecution they're going to face. And he talks to them in John 15, into John 16, like friends, not like slaves. Right? He's giving them inside information, so to speak. He wants to reassure them. He wants to help them face what they're going to face. And he's talking to them uh, like a man speaks to his friend, not like slaves. And we see the purpose of that loving concern given to us in verse 1. He says, These things I have spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble, so that you shouldn't fall away. That's the concern of the Lord here in speaking to his disciples, in warning them, in instructing them. He wants them to persevere in the faith. He doesn't want the persecution that's coming, the hatred and hostility of the world. He doesn't want trials and difficulty and adversity to cause them to fall away, to cause them to stumble. Now we see that same loving concern for the disciples as the Lord prays for them in John chapter 17. Flip the page and look at John chapter 17 and drop down with me to verse 6. The Lord has this concern for them, that they are kept by the power of God, that they persevere in the faith, right? They hang in there. They stay with it. They don't fall away. Look at verse six. Now, the Lord is praying here. He's praying and he says, I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me 
and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given them the words which you have given me, and they have received them and have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. He says in verse 9, I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but I pray for those whom you have given me, for they are yours, and all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Verse 11, he's departing, right? Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. His concern is that they persevere in the faith. God the Father, keep them. I'm departing, keep them. He says in verse 12, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. See the Lord's concern here, right? In his, prayers, in his prayer for his disciples, that God the Father should keep them. They are not of the world, verse 16, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Set them apart to you, God, right? As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. And we see that loving concern for the disciples. We also see that loving concern for you and I, don't we? The same loving concern the same concern of the Lord is that when we face difficulty, when we face adversity, no matter what shape it comes in, specifically here, it's persecution. Persecution from a hateful, hate-filled, hostile world. And we face that kind of difficulty. We're to persevere in the faith. We're to trust Christ and press on. He is faithful. He's faithful. We're to remember him and to press on in the work. But whatever adversity, whatever difficulty you face, Whatever it is, trust Christ. Press on. He has that same loving concern for us. Look at John chapter 17 and look at verse 20. Here, he prays for you and I for the same thing for which he prayed for them. He says in verse 20, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That's prayer for me. That's prayer for you. The Lord Jesus Christ praying for you, praying for me, that we would persevere, praying for us, that they, verse 21, all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them, you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. What a glorious blessing, right? To have the Lord Jesus Christ praying for you, praying for me. Saw this this last week, just charged me up. Robert Murray McShane said this, if I could hear Christ praying for me in the next room, I would not fear a million enemies. Yet distance makes no difference. He is praying for me. So back in John 16, the Lord graciously warns them. He graciously warns them. He warns them with a purpose in verse 1 that they should not be made to stumble so that they wouldn't fall away. And he warns them again here in verse 2. More specific this time. He says in verse 2, they're going to put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. These things are going to do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. Now he explains that again in verse 4. These things, verse 4, I've told you that when the time comes, you may remember that I told you of them. So when we face persecution, when we face the hostility, the hatred of this world for our faith in Christ... We are to remember, we're to remember, keep in mind 
those things which the Lord has told us. And remembering his words, right? Remembering his words to us is a means by which he holds us. He keeps us. He preserves us. It's a means by which we keep from falling away. Now, the things, the things he told us here, verse 1, verse 4, the things he's told us aren't restricted to his warnings. Not restricted to his warnings. He's given us both warnings to heed and he's given us promises to hope in, right? Promises to trust in. He's given us doctrine. He's given us reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness. He's given us encouragement. He's given us comfort. And he's given us warnings and he's given us promises. All of his word, all of his word is given to sustain us, to cause us to persevere. Remembering his word is to keep us from falling away. You want to persevere in the faith? Do you want God, by his spirit, according to his power, do you want God to preserve you in the faith? Then take heed according to his word. Remember the Lord's words to you. Remembering his word keeps us from falling away. The grace of his word, like a fetter, is to bind our wandering hearts to him. Our sinful hearts are prone to wander, aren't they? All the time. All the time. So our responsibility, our responsibility is to remember what he told us. And trusting him, we do what he's told us. And that is one means by which he keeps us from stumbling. One means by which he preserves us in the faith. The Lord's concern in John chapter 16, verses 1 through 15, is that we persevere in the faith. These things I have spoken to you, verse 1, that you should not be made to stumble. Now, someone might say, right? You might foresee the obvious objection based on teaching of the modern church today. Someone might say, I'm a, I'm a Christian, right? I'm a Christian. I can never stumble. I can never fall away. I will never lose my salvation. Do we hear that? Let's you and I for a moment consider that objection, consider that thought, and remember the Lord's words here and heed his warning. I want you to follow me now with the Lord's train of thought. And this is important. This is something we have to constantly remind ourselves of. One, because our own hearts are deceitful. Our own hearts are self-justifying, deceitful above all things, right? We have to remind ourselves of these things because our own hearts can deceive us. We also have to constantly remind ourselves of these things because the world is teaching a lie. The modern professing church often teaches a lie when it comes to these truths. Remember the Lord's words Consider the context. Listen to what the Lord is saying here in John chapter 16. The 11 disciples following the Lord right now to the Garden of Gethsemane here, the, the 11 disciples are saved men. They're saved men. He said to them, the Lord did in John 15, 3, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. These 11 men, minus Judas, who's off on his traitor's errand right now, right? The other 11 are saved men. And yet the Lord's primary concern for them in John chapter 16, verse 1, is that these saved men, right, would not stumble or fall away in the face of persecution. He tells them that when persecution comes, they must remember his words. He even prays for them, right? Prays for them and asks the Father to keep them in John chapter 17, verse 11. Now, a modern-day evangelical, right, a modern-day typical professing churchgoer, professing Christian, Walking along with them along this path of the Garden of Gethsemane might interrupt and might say to the Lord, might even rebuke the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, why in the world are you giving me these warnings? I can never lose my salvation, right? Once saved, always saved. Why are you warning me like this? Why are you talking to me as if I can lose my salvation? By Satan's design here, there is so much damning error that comes stuffed within the skin of truth. And it's so, that's what makes it so deceitful, so insidious, is that it comes wrapped in the skin of truth, 
But that skin of truth stuffed with a lie, and our deceitful, self-justifying hearts are only too willing to suck it now. Now, here's the, here's the damning error, all right? Here's the damning error. So many treat salvation like a vaccination. You receive your shot when you are 6 or 12, 26, 36, right? And after you receive your shot, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to do anything. There's no need to persevere, and there's no need for the Lord to preserve us. You've gotten your vaccination, right? Gotten your shot. There's no need to do, do, do. Why would you be concerned about being a do, do, do Christian, right? Just keep remembering the shot that you got. (laughs) There's no need to sell out for Jesus. No need to get radical. No need to strive to enter by the narrow gate. The way is not difficult, which leads to life. No need to exercise yourself toward godliness. No need to be concerned with pursuing holiness. No need to be diligent to make your calling and election sure. No need to labor, striving according to his working in you. No need to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. No need to strive for obedience to him in all things. Just remember your shot. Just remember that vaccination you got when you were three. (laughs) Here's the biblical truth, right? Here's here's what the Bible, you recognize all of those are from scripture, right? Here's the biblical truth. There's a sense in which our salvation is like a vaccination. (laughs) There's a sense in which our salvation is like a vaccination. You got a shot of new life in Christ when you were born again from being dead in trespasses and sins, right? You are declared innocent and you got the shot of Christ's imputed righteousness. Praise God, right? The penalty that you deserve from your sin was paid in full at that time by Christ on Calvary's tree. Praise God. The power of sin, defeated, broken by Christ. Now in him, you will never die. What an awesome shot, right, to our dead, wicked, deplorable, disgusting, needy hearts. Now you can't do anything to earn that. You can't do anything to buy it. You simply trust Christ for it. You entrust yourself to him to receive it by faith, right? You trust him. That's a repentant faith, a repenting believing, a believing repentance. You trust Christ entirely for it. You entrust yourself to him. However, however, here's the difference. The Bible clearly teaches And the Bible clearly teaches here in John chapter 16, verses 1 through 4, when speaking of the warnings that the Lord Jesus Christ is giving here, consider how this fits together. The Bible clearly teaches that the Lord must preserve us. We must be kept by the power of God for that salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, right? Now, we are kept by the power of God. We're not kept by our own power. We couldn't keep ourselves one second We're kept by the power of God. And listen, his ongoing preservation of his own is just as necessary to our salvation as anything else that Christ has purchased on the cross for us. You hear that? You understand that? In other words, if he doesn't preserve us, we don't go to heaven when we die. It is his preservation of us, his keeping of us, is as necessary to our full and final salvation as anything else that Christ has purchased for us on the cross. Christ has purchased that for us by his death on the cross, by his sacrifice. The reason that we are kept, the reason that we're kept is because God has promised to keep us. God himself has promised to keep us and he is faithful to his promise, amen? I am persuaded, I am persuaded, I'm convinced, I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed to him until that day. Now the way that we are kept, the way that we are kept is by the grace of God in the power of the Spirit through appointed means. God uses means. 
It is necessary that God keep us, that God preserve us, right? It's necessary that he do that. It's necessary. That's the way it's gonna be for eternity, right? It's not that you and I one day got our vaccination, so to speak, and now we can do whatever we want. We're saved. And so from now, for all of eternity, God can be sort of this ancillary afterthought because we're saved now. <laughs> so in essence, what do we need him for, <laughs> right? No, God must keep us. Your life in eternity will always be by faith in the Son of God who died and gave himself for us. Your life in eternity will always be trusting in Christ, trusting in God, the power of God keeping you throughout eternity. God will always keep us. He'll never let us go. He'll never forsake us. He'll never abandon us. But the way that we are kept is by the grace of God and the power of the Spirit through the appointed means that God has appointed. Those means which God has appointed for our perseverance. So this is important, all right? These are the means by which the Lord applies the effects, so to speak, of the vaccination. These are the means by which the Lord preserves us under the healing balm of the vaccination, right? And the Lord has, in his wisdom, ordained that it should be this way. So in other words, to all those who would say, I'm a Christian, right? I'm a Christian. And so the, all that I need to do, all that I need to do now, now that I'm a Christian, now that I'm saved, now that I got my vaccination, all I need to do is I just need to remember that shot I got. And whenever I'm concerned, whenever I, you know, just don't want to strive, don't want to obey, don't want to follow him. I just need to remember that vaccination that I got. I need to meditate on that vaccination and just remember that I'm, I'm a Christian. No, no, no. God has appointed means by which he preserves us to the end that we might be saved. And we are charged by God with the responsibility of applying those means in our own life in the power of the Spirit, through faith in Christ, right? The one means by which he keeps us, one means by which he preserves us, John chapter 16, verse one. He keeps us by causing us to remember his word and we take heed according to his word and we trust him and we follow him. Causing us, he causes us by his Spirit to heed his word so that we don't stumble. Now to preserve us in the faith, he tells us, Listen, to preserve us in the faith, he tells us to exercise ourselves toward godliness by faith in the power of the Spirit. And you and I, we persevere in the faith by doing just that. When the Lord commands us to exercise ourselves toward godliness, that is an appointed means by which the people of God persevere in the faith. What are you doing if you're not exercising yourself toward godliness? You're falling away. You're falling away. You've heard the analogy right before that a shark, in order for a shark to breathe, it has to continuously, some sharks, have to continuously press wa uh, pass water over their gills. In other words, they have to keep moving. Keep moving. If the shark stops, the shark starts dying. Hey, listen, you're a Christian and the Lord preserves us through appointed means. So if you stop pursuing those means, what are you doing? You're dying. <laughs> You're dying. You feel the encroaching death, right? He tells us that in order to live, we must put to death the deeds of the, the body by the Spirit. He tells us that if we do not do that, he says that we'll die. So what do we do? We persevere by doing that in faith. We persevere by doing that in faith. He tells us to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Listen, he tells us to strive. He tells us to agonize. He tells us to be diligent. He tells us to labor. He tells us to fight sin. He tells us to pray. He tells us to meditate on his word. He tells us to evangelize. He tells us to love the brothers. All of this by faith in his power. He tells us to do these things. And it's through these means that God preserves us in the faith, right? Now, if you're not, if you're not persevering in these means by faith, in the power of his spirit, then you're not persevering in him. You're not persevering in him. And he has said 
that it is he that perseveres to the end that is saved. Now, do you see the difference, right? You see the, the first, the error, the error that is stuffed into the skin of a truth, right? It comes to us in the form of a half-truth, which is a deadly whole lie. Do you see the difference, right? We do get a glorious one-time vaccination. We get a glorious sacrifice on our behalf. But our preservation, our preservation involves going to rehab. <laughs> His persevering of us is a rehabilitation process. It's us going to rehab, in essence. And he has promised to never leave us. He has promised to never forsake us. But he has promised that if we are truly in him, if we are truly in him, then we will be in rehab. <laughs> We're going to be going through that, amen? That rehab comes through means. Our responsibility, our responsibility is to trust him, to trust him every day. Now, notice the difference here between the lie and the truth. Notice Satan's deception. One is the error of antinomianism, lawlessness. One is antinomos, against the law. It's the error of antinomianism. It is easy believism. It's a repackaging, if you will, of the Keswick error of let go and let God. You just got to do what you want to do. Just do what you want to do. As Satan worshipers say that, don't they? Isn't that the... <laughs> the other represents the Christian life. Now, even if you have difficulty fully understanding or grasping these things, these things are worthy to be meditated on. This is what Scripture teaches, all right? To think through, to process in your heart and mind, to understand what the Bible teaches. These things are very important to understand. But if you don't fully grasp them, right? If you don't fully grasp them, it's all very simple and very clear by God's grace. When the Bible says to strive, what do you do? Strive. You strive. Pretty simple, right? <laughs> Pretty clear. When the Bible says strive, you strive. You trust him, and you strive. You strive by trusting him. You strive in the power of the Spirit, trusting him, but you strive, right? You strive. When the Bible says to exercise, what do you do? That's right, you get you catch on quick, right? You exercise. You exercise. You trust him and you exercise yourself toward godliness. When the Bible says obey, what do you do? You obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way, right? Be happy in Jesus. What happens when you don't obey? means that you don't trust him, means that you don't trust him, and you begin dying. What happens? John chapter 15, verse 1, 2 through 6, 7, 8, when you don't abide in him, when you don't abide in him, what starts happening? You start becoming withered as a branch. Eventually, you are cut off, cast out as a branch. Those are gathered up, and they are burned in the fire. When the Bible says abide, what do you do? You abide. You abide. You trust him. You trust him. You entrust yourself to him and you abide. Now, someone might retort to all that. Where's the grace in that? <laughs> Where's the grace? Aren't we to rest in his grace? Aren't we to rest in his grace? Yes. Yes, we're to rest in his grace. But listen, rest in his grace from the guilt of condemnation. Rest in his grace from the fear of death. Rest in his grace from the just penalty of the law that is our due. Rest in his grace, in some part, right, but not in all parts, from sin. Victory over sin that the Lord gives us. But it's not all rest, right? That other sin we battle. It's a fight. It's a battle. Grace in the New Testament is not rest from labor. Do you see? There's a sense in which that's often presented that way. That somehow when we become converted, when we're saved, all of a sudden now it's rest from labor. Why try? Why labor? Why do? 
we forget that it's the grace of God that teaches us to deny ungodliness. It's by grace that Hebrew says we may serve God acceptably. Listen to Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10. Listen to what Paul says. Paul says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. But I, Paul says, labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, Paul says, but the grace of God which was in me. What did the grace of God in Paul cause him to do? Labor. And it caused him to labor abundantly, more abundantly than they all. That was the grace of God at work in Paul. If the grace of God is at work in you, you're going to be at work in him. Right? That's the grace. That's the grace that we're talking about. That's biblical grace. That's Christ-purchased, God-given grace. And we get all that from an understanding of what the Lord is communicating back in John chapter 16, verses 1 through 4, all right? The disciples, the disciples then and now, disciples then, and you and I disciples now, we must persevere through persecution and difficulty by remembering his words. That is an appointed means to our preservation. It's an appointed means to our perseverance, remembering his words. It is the means by which they, and the means by which you and I are preserved, one means by which we're preserved from stumbling, from falling away, okay? Now, all of this, all of this is to be done by faith in Christ, by faith in Christ. When they face persecution, when someone's kicked out of the synagogue, verse 2, right, or killed, They are to remember his words and trust in Christ. Trust in Christ. In verses five through six last week, we saw how they should trust his plan. He has a perfect plan. They weren't considering his plan in verses five and six. And then in verse seven last week, we saw that how they should trust in his provision. He's gonna provide for them the helper. What a glorious blessing. Now, we aren't to persevere in our own strength. If we should persevere in our own strength, then somehow we get the glory for our perseverance. That's not going to be the case. We are to persevere in the strength of God's spirit. God gives his spirit as provision for us so that our strength is in him, our persevering is in him, and God gets the glory. Peter says this in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11. Peter says, if anyone ministers... Let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Christ Jesus, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Right? If you're going to minister, if you're going to labor, if you're going to face persecution, if you're going to evangelize, if you're going to read your Bible, if you're going to pray, if you're going to love the brothers... Whatever you do, do that by faith in Christ in the strength which God supplies by his spirit. And in all of that, with the strength that God supplies by faith in Christ, all glory goes to God. All glory goes to Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now this promised help, God sends in John chapter 16, verse 7. And he says there, explains there, verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. This is an emphatic statement, very important. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. I'll send him to you. As we come to now, the Lord Jesus Christ saying in his departure, they're sorrowful over the persecution they're going to face. They're sorrowful over their loss at him leaving. They're sorrowful. Sorrow has filled their hearts. But again, in his grace and his mercy to them, his grace and mercy to us, he reassures us that it's to our advantage that the Lord Jesus Christ goes away. Now we're gonna explore that advantage in point three and four uh, on your notes in your bulletin, all right? Point three is this. The spirit is at work in the world. It's to our advantage that the Lord Jesus Christ departs because in departing, he will send the spirit And the Spirit is at work in the world. We're going to look at the Spirit's work in the world in verses 8 through 11. Look there with me, verse 8. When he, when the Spirit of God, Spirit of truth has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. 
and of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. And when the Spirit of God comes, all right, he has a convicting ministry to the world. A convicting ministry to the world. That word in the Greek has a, a semantic range to it, a range of meaning. And I think that much of that semantic range is included here in the use of this word in verse 8, all right? Usually translated, that word means to convict, to reprove. Some of your translations say to convince or to expose. That word is used in Matthew chapter 18, verse 15, when in that church discipline process or resolving conflict within the church, you're to go to your brother who sinned against you and you're to tell him his fault between you and he alone. Tell him his fault translates the same Greek word, right? It has that kind of understanding to it. The convicting work of the Spirit in the world is to, in essence, tell them their fault. He has a convicting, a convincing, a reproving, an exposing work to do in the world. Seems to be that sense here in verse 8. In that sense, he renders a verdict, if you will. He renders a verdict. In other words, the Spirit of God, Elenko, he publicly exposes the guilt and shame of the world, and he calls people in the world to repentance. That's what the convicting ministry of the Holy Spirit in the world is, okay? In that ministry, the Spirit of God reproves and convinces so that many are genuinely converted. Now, that's a positive side to that Spirit's work, the Spirit's work in the world, right? He convicts, he exposes, he renders a verdict, he exposes their guilt, their shame. He tells them their fault, so to speak, so that many in the world, hearing the gospel, hearing the preaching of the gospel, are genuinely converted. The Spirit does that work. In others, that ministry of the Spirit, of convicting the world of sin, convicting the world of righteousness and of judgment, hardens them. And that hardening results ultimately in everlasting torment. Those people that reject the Lord Jesus Christ, they reject the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit in the world, burn in hell for all eternity. Now the Spirit of God, this ministry of the Spirit, is facilitated in one sense through the preaching of the gospel, through the preaching of the gospel. And a good example of this, once again, is Peter's sermon at Pentecost. Turn there with me to Acts chapter 2. Let's take a look at that sermon one more time. Another, just a good example of this very ministry of conviction that the Spirit does in the world. The Spirit is at work in the world, convicting the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Look at Acts chapter 2, and look at verse 32. Acts chapter 2, verse 32. Now, Peter has begun preaching his sermon at Pentecost. His sermon is full of conviction, convicting the Jews here of their sin against God, and their rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 32. Peter says, this Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this, which you now see and hear. This is the coming of the Spirit of God, right? The Spirit poured out at Pentecost. So the Spirit now, at work in the world, convicting of sin, righteousness, and judgment, as Peter is preaching his sermon at Pentecost, all right? Verse 34, for David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, conviction, right? Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, if Peter had preached this sermon one day earlier, Richard Phillips says this, one day earlier, and the only result would have been Peter's arrest. No one would have tolerated what he said. However, here with the Spirit working, with the Spirit at work through the preaching of God's Word to convict them of sin, righteousness, and judgment, and to convince His hearers to expose their guilt, to tell them their fault, the result here was completely different. Look at verse 37. When they heard this, 
by the grace of God, by the working of the Spirit of God, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent. Let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Opposite result we see in Acts chapter 7. Look at Acts chapter 7. Again, this is the Spirit's work. The Spirit's work. To some, when they hear the gospel preached, the Spirit of God breaks their heart over their sin, brings conviction to their heart. It makes That conviction makes its way from their head to their heart. The Spirit of God causes them to be born again, right? They see the exceeding sinfulness of their sin and they come to repentance and faith. In others, the work of the Spirit of God hardens. It hardens. Look at Acts chapter 7 and drop down to verse 51. Acts chapter 7, beginning in verse 51. Here, Stephen preaching. Very similar, very similar sermon. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. He is telling them their fault, right? The Spirit of God telling them their fault, exposing the unfruitful works of darkness. That exposing there, the unfruitful work, by, by the way, is the same word, elenko, exposing their wickedness, right? He says, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your father not, fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. Now, when they heard these things, they were, same phrase, right, cut to the heart. They didn't respond by turning from their sin, their wickedness and repentance and faith. They turned in hostility, in hatred. They gnashed at him with their teeth. Verse 55 but he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. By this convicting work, the convicting work of the Spirit in the world, the convicting work of the Spirit of God, Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15, Paul says that we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one we are the aroma of death leading to death. And to the other, the aroma of life leading to life. Those are the two effects of the preaching, right? The Spirit of God at work convicting the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. When the preaching of the gospel goes out, it is going to be the aroma of life leading to life for those who are being saved. It's going to be the aroma of death leading to death to those who will reject the Lord Jesus Christ and fall into hell Remember what the Lord said back in John chapter 16. Remember what the Lord said in chapter 14, verse 12, right? When the Lord said in John chapter 14, verse 12, he said that when he goes, when he departs, his disciples, those men at that time and us down through the ages, his disciples will do greater works, greater works, he says there, because he goes to the Father, right? Right? And we established there in John chapter 14 that he was referring to the coming of the Holy Spirit. And what greater works do his disciples do? They don't, they don't raise people from the dead. That's a pretty great work, right? They're not restoring withered arms. They're not restoring people born deaf, restoring their hearing, people born blind, restoring their sight. So what is the greater work that his disciples do? They preach the gospel and the power of the Spirit and conversion comes, right? Right? That's the greater work. So back in John chapter 16, verse 8 then, Jesus is referring to the same coming of the Spirit. And so he says in verse 7, it's to your advantage that I go away so that the helper can come. Well, that just means that in his death, in his burial, then in his resurrection and his ascension and in his session at the right hand of the Father, that then the Holy Spirit can come. The Lord Jesus Christ purchased by his blood, the promise of the new covenant in the coming of the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit then does that convicting work that is necessary for any sinner to be saved. The Spirit of God, in that sense, takes what Jesus Christ has accomplished at the cross, and he, the Spirit, applies 
to the sinner that truth, that sacrifice through repentant faith in Christ. Just as Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, the Holy Spirit takes that truth, convicts the world, and applies the work of Christ to save sinners. And unless the Spirit comes and does that work, no one would ever be saved, right? So you and I, you and I, are testimonies of the Spirit of God at work. When you were genuinely saved, it's because the Spirit of God caused you to be born again, granted you new life in Christ, opened your blind eyes, opened your deaf, stopped ears, and you were given repentance and faith. So how does this then encourage us in the preaching of the gospel? That's what the Lord is doing here, right? Listen, disciples, you men, you're gonna face severe persecution severe persecution. They're going to be excommunicating you, kicking you out of the synagogues. They're going to be killing you, thinking they do God's service, right? And we see that attested to in church history. All of those men were killed. John exiled, eventually died in exile, right? They're going to do these things to you. How would this truth then encourage them in the preaching of the gospel? The Spirit of God is at work. The Spirit of God is at work. And we've used this simple analogy before, but if uh, someone was standing right there in the lobby and they're standing there, right, and they're hearing the preaching of God's word and they're weeping, right, they're weeping, their heart is tender, soft, and you knew, you knew God had revealed it to you in a vision. Right? You knew that if you walked out in the lobby and you shared the gospel with them, you preached the gospel to them, that person right there on the spot is going to be saved. There'd be log jam trying to get out the door to go share the gospel with that guy, right? You'd have to wrestle somebody to get to him to share the gospel, right? What keeps us from going out and sharing the gospel all the time, knowing this gracious promise of the Lord Jesus Christ, him having departed, now the Spirit of God has come, the Spirit of God is at work in every one of those conversations. When you're standing at the door and you're pleading with someone to turn to repentant faith in Christ, to to turn from their sin and be converted when you're pleading with them, God, the Spirit of God, is pleading through you. The Spirit of God is at work in that. Now, some it's going to harden, but others are going to be saved. You're going to be the aroma of death leading to death. And listen, settle in your heart. That's the way it goes. You're going to stink like death to some people. But others, you're the aroma of life leading to life. And in all of that, God is at work. There are no chance encounters, right? This is all by the providence of God. Go out and share the gospel. That, that should encourage you in the preaching of the gospel. That should encourage you when you face persecution, when you face the world's hatred. You know, in sales, in sales, they'll talk to guys that make sales calls all the time, right? And they'll say, you know, you just keep getting no's, keep getting no's, keep getting no's. You get 100 no's, there's coming a yes. All right? So what do sales guys do? They just keep making calls. Listen, that's sales. We've got the greatest message ever conceived of, conceived by God himself in his grace and mercy. Preach the gospel, right? And sinners get converted. Now, the convicting work of the Spirit has three objectives, three objectives. Convicting the world of sin, convicting the world of righteousness, and convicting the world of judgment. First, in verse 9, convicting the world of sin. Now, of sin, verse 9, because they do not believe in me. Now, the first work of the Spirit of God is to convict of sin. McShane says again, it is to give a person a sense of the dreadfulness of his sins and to make him feel how surely he is a lost sinner. You see, this conviction, the work of the Spirit, the work of the Spirit in convicting of sin does not merely result in an admission of sin. All you got to do, right, is admit, believe, and confess. No, I beg your pardon, that's not the way that works. It doesn't result in a mere admission of sin. I'm a sinner, and you know, besides, we're all sinners. No, no. The conviction of the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God, the conviction that the Spirit of God uses to convict one of sin seeps into the heart and wrecks a man. Whitfield talks about how often this comes regarding one primary sin, 
where the Spirit of God convicts of one primary sin, uses that sin to wreck a person before saving them. And he talks about the woman at the well. Remember in John chapter 4, the Lord Jesus Christ talking to the woman at the well says, go get your husband. Go get your husband. Instantaneous conviction, right? She answered, the woman at the well answered, I have no husband. I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have well said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. In that, you spoke truly. Now that powerful conviction over that woman's adultery led to further conviction over all her sin. It says there that the woman then left her water pot went her way into the city and said to the men, come see a man who told me all things I ever did. Remember the account of the Lord Jesus Christ knocking Saul off his horse on the road to Damascus. The Lord convicts him. Why, Saul, are you persecuting me? It says that Paul was so convicted over his sin that he didn't eat or drink for three days. That conviction by the Spirit of God and the heart of a sinner wrecking the man. Now, let me ask you, has this happened to you? Has this happened to you? The Bible says that when he comes, when the Spirit of God comes, he will convict the world of sin. The primary reason for this conviction over sin is given in verse 9. He says it's because they do not believe in me. They do not believe in me. Unbelief is the root of all sin, right? It's the foundation of all sin. There's no sin that is worse than unbelief. Many hear the gospel, right? Many are called, what? If you were chosen. Many are called. Many hear the gospel. They acknowledge what Christ has done. They see the price that was paid, the blood that was shed, and they respond with indifference. They're hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. What should cause them to put their head in their hands and weep? They respond to with cold indifference or with hostility. They are cold hearted. Let me ask you, at some point, have you been made by the Spirit's work? Have you been made by the Spirit to feel, to understand that in you dwells no good thing? When the Spirit of God convicts of sin, he brings you to the end of yourself. He brings you to the end of yourself. Spiritual bankruptcy all your righteousness is as a filthy rag. You are an unprofitable, unworthy, undeserving servant. You have gone astray. You have turned aside. You've done what's right in your own eyes. You are a wicked sinner. Have you ever been brought to the point where you have nothing, right? All you have left is to throw yourself at the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ and plead with mercy. God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Have you been brought to the point where you have nothing left? You have not a shred of your own righteousness, not a shred. Anything that you think you've done good is as a filthy rag in God's sight. Has the Spirit ever moved you? Moved you to the point where all you want in this world is to flee to Christ. Have you ever experienced that? That's the Spirit's work of convicting of sin. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. God says this, I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the Spirit of grace and supplication. Then... They will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. You ever lost a loved one before? The Lord says that you will grieve for him 
as someone grieves for a lost son? Have you ever been brought to spiritual bankruptcy over your sin? If you've never mourned over your sin with a godly sorrow, you're not converted. You're not converted. The work of the Spirit of God is to convict of sin. We were standing at a doorway with a man, and he was telling me, I just, I've never felt that I was really uh, that much of a sinner. Really never thought of myself as a bad person. Listen, on the authority of God's word, if that's you, you're not saved. You're not, a, you're not a saved person. The Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin. All of this comes through the preaching of the good news. It's the preaching of the good news that must be preached in the context of the bad news. They have to fully understand the bad news. You know, it's interesting that considering this convicting work that the Spirit of God is called the comforter. Now, why is that? Why is that? The Spirit of God doing that convicting work, wrecking your heart over your sin, the gracious work of God by His Spirit in the, in the heart of a sinner, why is the, He then called the, comforted, the comforter? He's called the comforter because blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. That's right. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Rest from what? Rest from the burden of your sin. Remember um, Christian, right? In bon Bunyan's Pilgrim, Pilgrim's Progress. He's carrying this load on his back. At first, he doesn't even realize he has it on his back. He comes to understand the weight of that sin, that big, huge pack of sin on his back, right? And there are many different directions that he can go to remove the weight. He can go to... Uh, morality, Mr. Morality, and get it removed. He can go to, can go toward legalism, get it removed. Ultimately, he goes to the cross of Christ to have his sin removed. The Spirit of God convicts the world of sin. Secondly, verse ten, the Spirit of God convicts the world of righteousness. Verse ten of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Most people that you talk to today would profess their own righteousness. We know that from being out witnessing, right? They say, I'm a good person. Do you believe you're a good person? Yes, I do. <laughs> right? They profess their own righteousness. We've already established that is not the case. There are none who do good. No, not one. There's only one. There's only one who has lived who deserves to be in the presence of God. Only one. Only one who perfectly fulfilled the law, fulfilled all righteousness, and unless you have his righteousness, you will never see God. Unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never see God. The root of all sin is unbelief, but it is faith or belief in Christ for his righteousness that saves. If you're to be saved, you must have his righteousness. And the Lord Jesus Christ perfectly fulfilled the law of God, he goes to the cross, cross as a perfect sacrifice. God imputes, if you're in Christ through repentant faith, God imputes your sin to Christ and Christ bears your sin on the cross. At the very same time, God imputes the perfect righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ to you. You have his righteousness and you become the righteousness of God in him. In him, you become perfectly holy. You don't have to turn there. Let me just read it to you. Philippians chapter three explains this well, beginning in verse seven, where Paul says, but what things were gained to me, these I have counted, I've counted them all, Paul says, I've counted them as loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, 
if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. The righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ was proven acceptable to God by the fact that God raised him from the dead. He raised him from the dead. Because I go to my Father and you see me no more, verse 10, his righteousness proven by his resurrection. Verse 11, the Spirit of God also comes and convicts the world of judgment. Of judgment, verse 11, because the ruler of this world is judged. It's interesting, that word there, is judged, is past tense. It's past tense. But the Lord is speaking here of the cross. The ruler of this world judged at the cross. The Lord Jesus Christ speaking of it in his omniscience as a completed final act that is coming, but he speaks of it as being so certain that it's in the past tense here. The ruler of this world is judged. If you think about it, verse 9, verse 10, verse 11, this is the preaching of the gospel. This is the preaching of the gospel. You preach of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Acts chapter 17, if you think about the preaching of Paul at the Areopagus, Paul said, these times of ignorance God has overlooked, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent. Why? Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he's appointed. Jesus Christ is that man. When you preach the gospel, you preach sin, you preach righteousness, and you preach judgment. You preach Christ. What does the Spirit do? The Spirit convicts the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment, and he testifies of Christ. In all of this, for those disciples walking to the Garden of Gethsemane with the Lord Jesus Christ on that night, and to all disciples through the ages that have come after them, this should lead us to boldness in our preaching boldness in our preaching, faithfulness in our preaching, trust in Christ. This should lead us to fervent hope in him. Right? God has given us a tremendous blessing. As the Lord Jesus Christ departed those men, as he ascended to the Father, as he sits now reigning and ruling at the right hand of God the Father, even now we have the promised Holy Spirit helping us, helping us in our preaching, helping convicting the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Let's be faithful to him, right? We've been given every glorious blessing that can be imagined is given it all to us in Christ. So we need to be faithful to him, amen? Amen, let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for this blessed assurance, this reassurance that we have from John chapter 16, Lord. We praise you and thank you, Lord, that you prepare us in your word, not as slaves, but as friends in John chapter 15. And you, Lord, allow us to see the reality of, of your plans and purposes fulfilled in Christ. You allow us to see uh, the persecution, certainly the world's hatred that, that is ours because we're in him, uh, because the world first hated him, it's gonna hate us also. And we praise you, Lord, for your blessed reassurance, the hope that you've given us, the joy that you've given us. You said that our, your peace is ours, your peace you give to us. You've promised to go and prepare a place for us. God, you promised to be with us even to the end of the age. And glory upon glory is you've given us the Holy Spirit who's at work in the world to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment so that when we, Lord, by faith in Christ and the power of your Spirit, go out to preach the gospel, the Spirit is at work in the world already. The Spirit is at work in the world through the gospel to convict. And we know that our labor is never in vain in the Lord. So we thank you, Lord, for that beautiful blessing, that beautiful truth. Help us to rest in it. God, give us a holy boldness thinking about these things. Let us be fervent and faithful in the ministry that you've given us to do. And keep us, Lord, by your word, keep us from stumbling. Uh, preserve us in the faith. I pray that no one here would fall short. God, I pray that if, any, if there's anyone here not saved, God, break their heart over their sin. Wreck them over their sin. Bring them to the end of themselves. Help them to see their righteousness as a filthy rag. Help them to see their sin more the way that you see it and save them, Lord, for your glory. Cause them to be born again. Grant them repentance and faith. May they see the beauties and the excellencies of the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. We love you, Lord. We thank you for our time together today. Thank you, Lord, for the blessing of going to the park this afternoon to see... Uh, Converted sinners baptized 
to hear testimonies and to welcome new members into our church. We're very grateful for that, Lord. I pray, pray that you'd bless our time together there. All for your glory, God, in Jesus' name. Amen.